from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This speaker is a special treat. I think any of us who have grown up reading science fiction knows the name of Frederick Pohl. He is one of the true living legends of science fiction, a man who has been critical to the field as a novelist and short story writer, as an editor, as an anthologist, and just as one of the, the real figureheads uh, of the genre. I suppose that, uh, like many of you, I, I discovered Fred Paul largely through his first books, many of which were written in collaboration with Cyril Kornbluth and Jack Williamson. In particular, I think of The Space Merchants, a vision of the future uh, over, uh, in which advertising agencies are all powerful. But Paul has gone on to, to, to win all of the awards and with the uh, much-honored Gateway began another series of, of very successful books about the Hichi. Uh, he's written memoirs, The Way the Future Was. He's known everyone who's ever been important in science fiction over the last 50 years. It is truly a great pleasure and honor to introduce Frederick Pohl. Thank you. I was enjoying that. Uh, I'm planning to read a little bit out of this book. I can't read the whole thing because it's uh, 350 pages, and I don't think you'll stay here that long. But I'll, I'll read a little bit, and then I suppose what I'll do is ask for questions. Are there going to be any? Is anybody going to have a question? <laughs> well, we'll find out when we get there. Anyway, this book is called The Boy Who Would Live Forever. And if it is part of your plan to rush off to Barnes & Noble to buy a copy, you can't. They have them in the stores, but <clears throat> for some technical reason, they're not allowed to sell them for another 10 days. I do believe they have them here, though. Um, this is a sequel to a book of mine called Gateway, as you heard. And if you haven't read Gateway, I'm so sorry for you. I mean, <laughs> it's really a very good book. Uh, and I hope this one is too. In Gateway, we discover these people who have come across a, an asteroid that's been pre-drilled out and populated by some ancient vanished race who left a bunch of spaceships around and people get up there and get into them and go where the spaceships will take them, but they're Destinations have been pre-programmed by these vanished people, so you never know where it's going to take you and you have no choice about it. Um, anyway, that's what Gateway is about. It's really a good book. I enjoyed it myself. <laughs> this is called The Boy Who Would Live Forever. And I had not planned to write any more about uh, the Hichi or Gateway or any of that stuff until my friend Robert Silverberg who's not only a very good writer, but a very persuasive person, told me he was about to do an anthology of stories from some of the uh, series of science fiction stories that have been around, and he wanted me to do one in the Gateway universe. So my wife and I happened to be cruising the Mediterranean at that time, starting in Istanbul and going on to Athens, which is why the first chapter of this takes place in Istanbul. And after I had written it, it occurred to me and it really made the good beginning for a novel. And over a period of several years, I wrote the novel. Now, I'm going to do something I don't usually do. I'm going to read something out of the middle of it. In the course of the book, we meet a bunch of new people. And one of them is on page 254 here. And he, the, his chapter is called Stove Mind in the Core. And I'm going to now read some. <clears throat> Whoops, that's not the right place. Where are we? Ah, I see, we're in the wrong place. We should be, <laughs> we should be on page 162. 
Okay. My name is Mark Antony, a matter which I wish to clear up. The fact that my name does not mean that I am an ancient male Roman. I am not any more than my associate Thor Hammerhurler, Thor Hammerhurler is a Scandinavian god. Actually, like Thor, I am not a man of any kind, since in essence I am nothing more than a simple computer drudge. I use the word simple, I don't mean really simple. I was generated merely to be among one of, among the 10 to the 10th computer intelligences that the human persons and the Hichi created to do odd, jo odd jobs for them when those two races built the wheel some centuries ago. Which wheel was constructed for the purpose of keeping track of that extra galactic nest of non-material entities who are collectively known as the Assassins, the Foe, or more recently the Kugelblitz. I don't need to say any more about them now, as I will say enough later on. Why then am I called Mark Anthony? The reason, I do not say it is a good reason, has nothing to do with the real Anthony's status as sexual partner of the Egyptian queen Cleopatra. The particular trait of, I have no expertise at all in this area. The particular trait of Anthony's, which caused me to be called by his name, is his reputation as a foodie, or as one might say more politely, an epicure. It is told, I don't say that this is a true story, that Anthony's tastes were so rarefied that his cooks were required to prepare six cereal dinners for him every day, so that at whatever hour he might choose to dine, one of those dinners would be always ready to be served at its peak of perfection. I don't know what they did with the other five dinners. Most likely, Mark Antony had extremely well-fed kitchen slaves. <laughs> the way in which I do resemble Mark Antony is that we both have exquisite taste. In any practical regard, the original Mark Antony and I are not so much twins as opposites. Antony never cooked a dish in his life. He wouldn't have known where to start. His only interest in food was the consumption of it. I, on the other hand, consume no food of any kind, unless you consider energy of food. What I am, or at least what the primary subroutine of mine that defies me is, is a grand top blanc master in the art of food preparation. There is very little that I do not know about a cuisine. No, to be truthful, there is nothing about it that I don't know, and almost nothing about it that I can't put into practice. With the aid, of course, of my effectors. Most AIs don't have them, I do. All this requires, of course, that I have access, access to a competent food factory. Most of my clients have no appreciation for the trouble I go to for them. O cuisine was entirely wasted, for instance, on my friend Harry. Harry's palate had been spoiled by the 45 human years he spent marooned on the depopulated planet of Ar Arabella. He had been hungry there, and he had been there for a long time. Simple calories were what he struggled to find, not gourmet subtleties. Consequently, now he doesn't care what he eats, as long as he's eating all he can possibly hold, in the sense, that is, that he eats it all. I could read more of that for you, but I think what I would rather do is uh, answer some questions if you have any. And if not, I'll just talk. Anybody got a question? Nobody has a question. There are microphones there. Here we go. I, I think we're, you know, this is a, a, it's not my opinion, is we're moving to an age of science fiction writers obviously have always been writing about the future, but as we move more into technology, we're seeing that one day we will have made artificial life. You know, how do you envision the, the, uh, the ramifications of when we've created something that it actually, ex it knows it exists. Well, my friend Marvin Minsky says that computers become more complex approximately every four years, which is to say about every time there is a new graduating class, class of gra graduate students in computers. And uh, I think he's probably right. If that happens in about six more generations, we'll have a computer roughly as complex as a human being, at which point I imagine that it will know what it is. At least it will know a great deal. And if it can't from that deduce what it is, then it's 
not really that good a computer. I had some interest in writing about people who had their minds stored in computers. I did that for a good many years without any real notion that it could ever happen. Then I ran into a man named Hans Moravec, who's a computer person at Case Western Reserve, who had a plan for doing that. He said, if you want to have your mind stored forever in a machine, what you do is go through some brain surgery. First, you have your corpus callosum, which is a thought thing about the size of a hot dog that links the two halves of your brain, and that's split in half. And then you have it reconnected through a computer. So that all the messages that go back and forth between the two halves of the brain will have to pass through the computer, which will learn them all. And after it has done it for a while, it will know you as well as you can be known. At which point, if you wish, you can turn off the organic brain and just live in that one forever. I don't know if that would work or not, but at least it might. And therefore, I feel justified in going on writing about machine stored human beings. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi. Um, it's a similar question. What is it like for you as the imagined future comes to us, becomes more known? I'm thinking of things like uh, sending cameras to the rings of Saturn and discovering planets. It, does it limit you or does it expand you? Well, I think seeing the future become the present has in general been a big disappointment. <laughs> it hasn't been nearly as nice as we wrote about it. You can't jump into your spaceship and fly off to Mars and have adventures with six-limbed six green Martians riding thoats. It isn't going to happen. There aren't any. But there have been a lot of things that happened that we didn't anticipate, which really have been pretty exciting. And the computer is probably the greatest of them. Uh, the computer is the first machine ever made which does not amplify human senses like a television or a microscope or something like that, or human muscles like most of the vehicles. What it amplifies is a human intelligence. And that has made it possible for a lot of people to do things that they could not have done without computers to help them along. And I think that's a wonderful development that I hadn't anticipated, at least not in that form. And that's, uh, it makes the whole thing worthwhile. The rest of it, I'm really kind of disappointed. I wish that we had had uh, the right sp kind of spacecraft, and it doesn't look like now they're ever going to happen, or at least not in the uh, immediate future, by which I mean the time before the sun goes out. Uh, and it just, it just isn't, there's no good way of making it happen. There is, of course, this notion that uh, Commercial spacecraft will be able to take people wherever they want to go. And indeed, I understand you can now buy a ticket to go on something like the Spaceship One that just won the X Prize for about $400,000, which will take you up to about 60 or 70 miles elevation. To that, I can only say big deal. <laughs> That's not where I want to be. I want to be at least in low Earth orbit, preferably on the way to the moon or even farther. That's not going to happen for individuals in the foreseeable future. And I'm sorry about that. But it, I do have some redeeming pleasures in writing about it, whether it's going to happen or not. Anybody else? Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. I'm interested in the New York science fiction writers from, say, the late 30s through the 50s. There are a lot of them, yeah. They all moved to California, but they started out in New York. I'd like to know your, uh, the, the sense of uh, social identity that was operating there. Uh, did people feel part of an, a beleaguered minority? Did they feel part of larger social networks of literary, political writers beyond the uh, science fiction community? What, what was the political orientation of the group and had in the, in the 30s and in the large part of the 40s we were seller Christians we got together and talked to each other knew each other pretty well but we did not relate to the outside world very much because they thought we were all crazy it wasn't until World War II came along with things like rockets and uh, spacecraft at least in the form of rockets that went up into space although they ultimately wound up on London 
uh, and then it began began to ha began to have some respectability. I'm not sure that's been a good thing entirely. Uh, there's a friend of mine who said that the trouble with modern science fiction is that it should go back into the gutter where it belongs. <laughs> and it was true that science fiction writers were a lot less handicapped in writing about the future when they didn't take themselves quite as seriously th as they do now. Because uh, the, the sort of flights of fantasy that we expected in the 30s and 40s just aren't happening anymore, or not very often. But science fiction fans, which is what I began as, and which what most of the writers I know began as, definitely felt detached from the human race. Because we knew that uh, we couldn't tell anybody what we were doing. When we read a magazine like Astounding, we would cover it up with something uh, not as offensive, like spicy Western stories or something, <laughs> so that nobody would know what our real addiction was. And that's how science fiction fandom, in an organized sense, began. Because when a few of us found out that there are others like us, we tended to clot together, first in science fiction clubs, local ones in New York and Chicago and LA, and then in conventions. I happened to be in the very first science fiction convention that ever happened. It was in Philadelphia in 1936. And what happened was that six New York fans got on a train, came down to Philadelphia, and declared themselves the first science fiction con ever. <laughs> Other people began copying us almost immediately. What we did at that first con, I don't really know. There were notes kept, but the secretary lost them, which I know because I was the secretary. <laughs> Probably we didn't do much very exciting there. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, as a member of, a, of the gay and bisexual community, um, sometimes I really don't enjoy seeking out books that are quote unquote gay fiction, um, and yet can sometimes feel left out reading fiction that where gay mm -hmm. characters or bisexual characters don't appear at all. And one of the things I was always so impressed by uh, in Gateway was that there were gay characters who just happened to be there, like, like people are. And you know, Anvil the Stars with uh, I guess Greg Bear wrote same thing. Did, what was the reaction at the time to that? And why does it seem that um, characters appeared in science fiction of late? I don't see that happen as often. Uh, you may be right. I'm not aware that they've disappeared from science fiction. But then, I have not been able to read the, all of the science fiction that's being published. There's something like uh, what eight or nine hundred science fiction books published each year. And uh, I read a lot. I probably average a book a day, but, you know, less than 10 percent of them are science fiction. So I don't really know what's happening in a broad sense. But when I was writing Gateway and the books around it, I was writing about human beings who come in many different flavors. And I wasn't trying to sing any particular kind as being unique or less attractive or less desirable than any other kind. Uh, and I'm glad to know that you think I succeeded in that book. And I wish everybody did. It does not seem to me that the, a human being's sexual preferences have anything to do with whether or not he's capable of governing a state or running a business or teaching a school. And I have believed that for a long time, and I intend to go right on believing it. Yeah. Uh, this is a great opportunity to um, address someone from the golden age of science fiction. <laughs> you mean somebody who's over 80 years old. <laughs> um, the opportunity uh, is especially uh, pertinent because of all the great other writers that you have known, such as Campbell and Bradbury, and you mentioned Silberg. Um, here's the question. Um, in all of these writers that you've known, uh, um, which one captivated you the most with his talent and why? Well, uh, I would say there are about hun a hundred did in one way or another. But one which was particularly interesting to me when I was a teenager was Jack Williamson. Jack had written a uh, two-part serial on Amazing Stories called The Stone from the Green Star. And I was accustomed to buying my magazines in second-hand stores, where you could get them for a nickel. But I happened to get the first installment of that 
in the second-hand store when the installment was still on sale in the regular conventional magazine outlets. And I couldn't wait. I had to go up and spend 25 cents at the stand to get that second installment. And I have to say that although I thought it was holy writ at that time, I no longer think it quite that exciting. In fact, it's the only one of Jack Williamson's serials that he has been unwilling to allow to be published in book form. And he's probably right. But what they were writing at that time was exciting because it was suggesting things that had not happened but might well happen and have great influence on the history of the human race. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, which Jack is still doing. He's now 96. I ran into Jack at his home a few months ago, and I said, we would known each other for many years, and I said, hey, Jack, I just finished a novel. And he said, so did I. <laughs> and I said, and I've begun a new one. And so have I. <laughs> 96 years old. He is my ideal. I want to be just like him when I grow up. <laughs> Yeah. Science fiction writing is, is normally considered a very optimistic writing by the sheer fact that you expect the human race to exist <laughs> for a while. Um, as things have gone on, do you still have that level of optimism, or do you think chance will wipe, our, wipe ourselves out? Oh, I don't think we'll wipe the human race out. I think we may, may well uh, deprive ourselves of some of the amenities we're used to, like <laughs> hot tub baths and uh, whipped cream on our ice cream and stuff like that because we are simply not preserving the sources of all these things very well. We're not really taking care of our water supplies which are running critically short all over the world. We're not taking care of our farms because they're being poisoned with pesticides and so on. We're not taking care of our world because our water is being poisoned by the runoff of these farms our air is being poisoned by the uh, the ex exhalings of smokestacks and cars, which our president claims do not exist. And uh, I'm afraid that things are going to get bad before they get worse, before they get better. However, I think in the long run the human race will survive, and if only because there, the number of people has been gradually or seriously decreased by the things that have gone wrong, I think they'll be better able to live in the planet 20 or 50 or 100 years from now. But I think that first step is a killer. I don't know quite what's going to happen, quite what's going to happen over the next decade or so. But it scares me. Yeah. 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 Well, it's been a true pleasure to read you over the years. Uh, your books have always been so full of good ideas and uh, storylines. Uh, if you could, what is the one idea that you've been most pleased with in your books? Um, different ideas at different times. When Cyril Cornbluth and I wrote The Space Merchants, uh, I was really pr thrilled with the idea of writing about a world in which something that was going on at the present could become dominant over everything else, in that case, the advertising business, which, as I understand it, led to a whole bunch of books by other writers, the category was called When the Plumbers Take Over the Universe, something like that. Uh, and those were the first, among the first uh, warning books, warnings about things that might happen in science fiction, which I think was a good thing to do, and I'm glad we did it then. But I got kind of tired of that, because uh, after all, I've been warned about almost everything that happened. I don't want to hear about it anymore. The next best idea I ever had was Gateway. I think the notion of this crew of intelligent aliens who came to our solar system half a million years ago and left behind the Gateway asteroid with all of its spacecraft in it was a wonderful idea in that I could do so many things with it. It would take me anywhere doing almost anything. And I don't usually get an idea like that very often. Actually, I tried to write it four or five different ways at different times before I finally decided to do it the way it is in the book, which is told in two different... Uh, once by in the, the present and once in the past. Well, never mind. If you read the book, you know what I mean. If you haven't, go do it. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, Fred, 
I think you sort of answered the question indirectly, but uh, I recall you writing once that you tried to write four pages a day. Is that still true? Um, I wrote four pages a day for many years. I began doing that when Cyril Kornbluth and I collaborated on several novels because uh, we had a system which was that Cyril would come out in the house in Red Bank, New Jersey, where he kept his own room with his own bed and his own typewriter. And we'd sit around and talk about what might happen in our books, what the characters might be like, what problems they had. And when we had thought of enough to see we could begin the book, we would flip a coin, and the loser would go up to the third floor and write the first four pages. <laughs> then he would come down at the, age of, at the bottom of page four and say, you're on, and then the other person would write the next four, stopping sometimes in the middle of a word, and not, not ever telling the other person what was supposed to come next. <laughs> and this worked out very well with Cyril, probably because we'd more or less grown up together, and we thought more or less the same way about the world, and it turned out to be an extremely efficient way to write a novel. We could write a novel pretty quickly and have a complete draft, uh, which was pretty good. It required a lot of tying up loose ends and cutting out things that didn't belong there and you know, general polishing and so on. But it was a complete skeletal form of the novel. I tried that with other writer and that didn't work a bit. But with Cyril, it worked very well. Then a few years later, after Cyril had done this horrible thing on me and went, gone and died on me, uh, I was stuck with a book I was writing, and I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll collaborate with myself. I'll do four pages today, and tomorrow I'll get up and do the next four pages, just as I used to do with Cyril. And that worked out really well for years. It didn't mean that every day's four pages ever wound up in print. Sometimes they were just bad and had to be thrown away. Sometimes they were revised a lot. Sometimes they were collapsed into other things. But each day I defaced four single pages of clean white paper, one way or another. And that really worked out well for me. Then unfortunately, a few years ago, I did a uh, catastrophic thing. I stopped smoking. I did that for a good reason, because I thought I would die if I didn't. But all the same, it interfered with my writing. I had been in the habit of sitting down at my computer or typewriter and writing these four pages. While I had a cup of coffee on one side and an ashtray on the other, I type a little bit, take a sip, type a little bit, take a puff. And the whole routine of writing was interrupted for me. And I couldn't really write very successfully. It took quite a while to get over that. So for that period, I did not keep keep up with my four pages a day. But I'm trying to get back on it now, and I have 10 minutes left. Another question. No? No question? Here comes one. I was curious, I was curious to ask you, you alluded to, someone alluded to some writers who were very aware of who they were. One of those comes to my mind is Robert Heinlein. I wonder what it was like to be with him, especially when he was writing message novels, very strong, the strong message novels. Uh, being with Robert Heinlein was very much like being with anybody else. He was very opinionated and articulate, but I know a lot of people like that. Uh, his politics did not necessarily agree with mine, but then they didn't agree with anybody else's in the world either. <laughs> He was his own man. Uh, what he wrote, however, was revolutionary. He was the first person who wrote well about actual human beings in, an, in a believable future. And he did it extremely well in everything he wrote from about his second or third year as a writer until about five years before he died, after which he went all uh, bizarre. <laughs> he began repeating old themes and quite often going back to revisit them. Uh, and you know, he wrote a book called, uh, uh, a book about Mars. What's the name of it? Say? The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, which I thought was his best book ever. And it wasn't about Mars, it was about the moon. And on that, in that novel, he described a future society on the moon, which was not very much like anything we have here, 
or indeed anything we're likely to evolve into, but it was a perfectly workable, desirable society. And in one of his last books, he went back and trashed the whole thing. The society had fallen apart, everybody was killing everybody else, very much like Yugoslavia in the last few years. And I, I really was angry at him for that. But he was a wonderful writer. In many ways, he's the father of us all. And I enjoyed my contacts with him. I was glad to know the man, and even gladder to read what he wrote. Anybody else? Oh, one other thing about Heinlein. He was a very sensitive human being. He got easily upset. When I was editing Galaxy, I had a man named A.J. Budras doing reviews for me. And I gave him an advanced copy of uh, one of Heinlein's novels. I think it was Glory Road. I'm not sure. And uh, A.J. reviewed it at some length. He was not the best reviewer in the world for me because he couldn't stop talking. His reviews would get longer and longer every month. But in this one, he outdid himself. He wrote about a 10-page review of this book in which he dissected everything Heinlein had ever done in his life and pointed out the folly he had committed. And I thought, uh, as this is such an intensely personal review, I better send a copy to Heinlein. So I did. And a few a week or so later, I got a manila envelope from him containing a lot of pages. And I thought, wow, you've written a novelette for me. And it wasn't. It was a letter denouncing the review <laughs> and saying, while he agreed with uh, AJ's right to free speech, he just didn't think he was fair in his discussion of the book. Because AJ, he was quite con confident was a very parochial sort of man. He doubted that he had ever been more than 50 miles from where he was born. He <laughs> doubted that he spoke another language. Uh, well, actually, A.J. was a diplomat, son from Lithuania. <laughs> and he'd been everywhere. But uh, out of kindness, I decided not to print his review. And I'm only sorry that I mislaid that letter, because it would do very well in somebody's archives. But he was a wonderful man, even if a bit quirky. Anybody else? Uh, yes, sir. Since you yeah. got into editing, yeah. I remember hearing a story you were telling at a convention a few years ago that cast a lot of light on the odds for new writers involved uh, uh, how, to, how to edit on the subway. And you know, that sort of thing. I don't know if you recall that particular story. And when I was editing Galaxy and If, I sometimes had an assistant uh, the one I had most of the time is a woman named Judy Lynn Del Rey, Judy Lynn Benjamin, who married Lester Del Rey. <laughs> She's well worth it, wonderful woman, and ultimately became the founder of Del Rey Books at Ballantyne. And I had Judy well trained. As manuscripts came in, she would take them out of the envelope they were in, put them in a return envelope with stamps, attach a rejection slip to them, and give them to me. And when I went to the office, I'd pick up 40 or 50 of those. And on the train going back to New Jersey, I would go through them, and about 95% of them would wind up in the mailbox at the train station. Because I never felt there was any obligation on me <coughs> to read any story past the point when I knew I couldn't possibly buy it. Which sometimes happened on the first page, sometimes and not until I was pretty much through it. But I, that's what happened. That is what the writers were up against a capricious editor like me, who did not care to give them guidance on what they should do with their lives. The reason for that was not that I was hostile to new writers, but because not very many of them were capable of taking such comments uh, in a way that was productive. I had several writers complain to me that they'd rewritten stories after my notes, and they considered that a contract, and when was they going to publish them? I had other writers complain that I uh, de destroyed their stamina, their will to, will to survive, by what I had said. So I tried not to give any personal comments unless there was something that I knew was easily explained and easily dealt with. But if you are submitting a story to a magazine, the odds that you will be rejected are very high. The good part of that is that the stories that are very good always get published. Nobody has any story that is really fine that they've been unable to get published. Somebody will do it. So new writers, don't worry about the odds. Go ahead and write your best and hope 
somebody will understand how good it is. Am I out of time yet? One, one more question. Anybody? One last exciting, insightful, <laughs> wonderful question. <laughs> Here comes one. I haven't read your new book, but I have Same. read <laughs> I have I have read the title, however. And um, the last it is a long title. The last fun. speaker uh, was asked if, given the option to live forever, uh, she would take it. Um, that was Catherine and Sarah. She said yes. Uh, I've just recently been reading, uh, rereading Isaac Asimov's *The Robots of Dawn*, which provides the opposite answer. And I'd be interested to know which side you line up on. Would I live forever if I could? I would live at least until I got bored. Uh, which hasn't happened yet. But at that point, I don't think I would care to live anymore. And it is quite possible, as I said, that people can be, did I say it here or at the television program? I was asked about uh, storing minds in machines. And did I just talk about that? Yeah, yeah well, you already heard it. Uh, so I believe that it is possible that a human being may, at some point, be able to live indefinitely. And I would be willing to do that, as I said, until I got tired of doing it, at which point I don't want to be around anymore. I don't fear death. I mean, death is, uh, death is the point at which I don't have to do anything I don't want to anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's not so bad. And thank you all for being here. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.